the floor! I told you you didn't be on that damn thing out there! I want you to be perfect! When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. It's him. He talks to me. He didn't slam you, he didn't bump you, he didn't nudge you, he rubbed you. And rubbing son is racing. Hey race fans, welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santoroski, I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk about everything racing. We've got a big, big weekend of racing to preview. Joining me in the studio I have Richard Uden and Louise Torres. Guys, how are we doing today? Good, thank you. Yourself? Wonderful. I'm doing pretty well. Yeah, so uh, we've got uh, on deck this coming weekend all the major series running on the same weekend for the first time since uh, sometime in 2019. And this is, we're talking real race cars. We're not talking a bunch of uh, eye racing, uh, which is why we gave Seth the night off tonight. So, <laughs> just, <laughs> no. just kidding, just kidding. Seth is, a matter of fact, covering some eye racing tonight. So uh, before we get into previewing this historic weekend that's got a lot of firsts coming up, uh, we did have a couple races at Pocono this weekend. And uh, before we start talking about Pocono, um, I would be out of line to not mention um, that uh, Dr. Rose Mattioli, who is the uh, co-founder of Pocono Speedway, um, the uh, the wife of Dr. Joe Mattioli, uh, the Mattiolis, um, built a speedway back in, I believe it was 1971 they opened up. Uh, and they have run that facility um, forever, and you know she's the matriarch of the track. Uh, she passed away um, uh, earlier in the week, so our thoughts are with uh, with her family and her friends. Um, but uh, again, just a tremendous amount of racing in Pocono with the first um, planned double header. Uh, this was this was scheduled to be a double header, unlike the other ones that we ended up with uh, this year. We had a flip flop on the result there, I believe. Um, Race one was Kevin Harvick over Denny Hamlin, Day, and race two is Denny Hamlin over Kevin Harvick. Uh, both got both those guys staking a, a healthy claim um, in this year uh, in their bid for the championship. So, uh, and we also had Xfinity in action as well as the trucks. Trucks running on the road course of Pocono, which was interesting to watch. So, uh, so Louise, you want to take it away? And talk to us a little bit about this um, very interesting weekend at Pocono. Oh yeah. As far as the truck series, they actually ran the two and a half mile circuit, but it did felt like a road course with all the chaos is happening in the early laps. It seems like first stage was never going to end. You had <laughs> a couple red flags in that one, but Sheldon Creed made it look like he can navigate Pocono really well. He went through the middle of Austin Hill and Brandon Jones, by the way, he did made an, a truck series start this time. It's not Kyle Busch for those wondering. Kyle Busch is done for the year in the truck series side of things. With, except for Texas, he's got one more now that I remind. But Creed had the lead, a beautiful pass, three wide through the tunnel turn. And then Brandon Jones fought back and got by him a lap later and went on to capture his first truck series win. Only for him in about an hour later to get wrecked out of the Xfinity race on lap number one. And whereas the Xfinity series decided to endure a lot of madness and mayhem involving a lot of the top contenders of this championship trail, just like, for instance, Noah Gregson had problems, Justin Haley and Riley Hurst, Michael and Ed, and Harrison Burton's rotten luck is now apparent after that's the second straight race in a row that he's had problems because he got wrecked out of Talladega. That angered Cody Vanderwall and upset at Josh Williams to a fall. But both Williams and Burton were, okay, were cool about it. They were able to fix some things. But for Burton, two straight accidents. In the span of two weeks, that's not a good look for him. What looked like he was on, going to be pretty unstoppable. Speaking of unstoppable, Chase Briscoe got his fourth Xfinity Series win and quite the battle with Ross Chastain in that one. So if we see something like that between those two guys, I think we're going to have a pretty good championship battle on our hands. But Chastain's got a bit of ways to go in that colleague right. But all those dash for cash monies that they've been having or the race wins with Almendinger and Haley this season – it's definitely going to help that team going forward, not going to lie. 
And then finally... They've certainly picked up, haven't they? Colleague have been impressive this year, I think. Oh, definitely, because there was that concern that I had. Could Colleague compete as yeah. far as the titles concerned? Because you have a pretty good talented driver, Justin Haley, that has finally got all three series win at a very young age. But it's a matter of finding that consistency. And his future is still borderline. He doesn't even know if he's going to be back in 2021. Yeah. Even though, yeah, one thing is certain is that aside from the All-Star race, even though he did say there was no plans of running Cup, there's still no plans beyond the All-Star race at Bristol as far as the Cup level. So he's pretty much so term, determined and focused on um, making the most out of the season, kind of like with Briscoe. Obviously, right now, Briscoe has been the guy to beat outside of Harrison yeah. Burton. It's just, yeah, I mean, and, and you know, they, they had, you know, colleague, you know, I know quite a few of the guys there, you know, uh, I've been really impressed. And they had a rough year last year with Nick Harrison's passing. But, you know, mm-hmm. they've done a great job there. They really have. And small team, startup team with a passionate owner. And, um, yeah, no, it, it's it's great. I mean, I, I can't think of the last sort of Xfinity team that sort of founded and grew in that way. Um, they've got to be given, you know, credit. And they're up in the mix every weekend, and Pocono is no different. Oh, most certainly. And I think, not just that a passionate owner, but also a very experienced and equally passionable team manager as <laughs> with, with Chris oh, Rice. Yes. Yes. We used to have some fun with Chris, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, you have an excellent poetry group of members, a group of personalities as well. Yeah. With AJ part-time, Haley and Ross, they, they work so well together. It'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see how they go moving forward because you're right. You have to go back to the chance to motorsports state to see a, a team, but even way back, I want to believe to an extent, Renzi and Bruco, where there was no for, cup driver owning the team that was just simply out yeah, of yeah, yeah. or wanted to be involved in the sport. So it's been a long time to see a team like Colleague or anything like it to be growing and growing as the season goes along and the Xfinity level, because you have those instances where they arrive at the next level, but they don't mesh well, or they have this high expectations that just don't last. It's like, look, I look back to a Herzog, when the team that Jimmy Johnson drove in the Bush Series, they after, they were they were there, but once Todd Bodine took over in 2002 into 2003, we saw what they were able to do. They just didn't have the funding. They had to yeah. close doors. So who knows how Herzog would have been long term with Todd. Maybe they could have won a championship. Who knows? But Cup race took forever. Not gonna <laughs> lie. Yeah, it was least. short though. It was shorter than normal. It was it was ten laps longer than Saturday's race. Well, that's true. But what's Pocono normally it's normally four hundred miles, isn't it? And it was only like three twenty five. Three hundred twenty five on Saturday, three hundred fifty on Sunday. Okay. But the way the red flag came out essentially the first ten laps didn't really factor into the race at all, other than Kurt Busch owning the competition in stage one, capturing the stage win. Essentially, it felt like another 325-mile race when you look at it, because once the rain and the storms were gone, they raced. But you still had some incidents with, like, Chris Buescher, Michael McDowell, who had a record 34th career last-place finish. He surpassed Joe Nemechek for that dubious dishonor. I'm but, sure my friend Brock Beard is all over that. Yep. Brock Beer from Last Car, lastcar.com. Yep, Car yeah. 34 with a 34th career last place finish. Mind you, most of those affair, well, Archuk was when he, in his young cup career when he was doing the Star and Parks for Prism as, and, all, and all that jazz. But as the race developed, the controversial moment of the race would have to be with Ryan Blaney, Kyle Busch, and yes, a good friend to Kyle, Garrett Smithley, factored into that mess. Where Fox then had a good replay, but it was like about an hour and a half later, NASCAR posted an exclusive footage, <laughs> like, like yeah. straight out of the HBO NFL Films quality, pristine quality, <laughs> where it showed Ryan Blaney not turning. And what, judging by that angle, it's very deceiving a little bit. I felt like if there was no grass, he could have go full send, win a little bit more lower because Bush held his line, Smithley was. Also in the way, but Blaney just misjudged and just flipped into Kyle and then ruined his day. And the winless streak continues because it looked like maybe now having the previous day notebook 
Bush probably could have been a contender for the win for the first time all year, but we'll never know because he got taken out. Yeah, Kyle, then, Kyle Bush is just having a miserable season this year. It's, you know, can, nothing. I, can I – Yeah. I, I know we're still talking about the race a little bit here, but let, let, let's wrap up the race, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the point I wanted to make. Let's wrap this race all right, up. All right, all right, bro. Darkness became an issue. The sunset, golden hour, they were able to get all – 140 laps in with Hamlin winning, surpassing Mark Martin equal on the all-time win list equal at 41, equaling Jeff Gordon for the most wins ever at Pocono with, with six. And that's all, pretty much all it. Fuel strategy didn't work out for Martin Truex Jr. It worked out quite well for Eric Jones. But all in all, it's Hamlin has pretty much inserted himself from being, like, basically the guy carrying Toyota to probably now, not only that, a championship contender, a championship favorite going to the second half of the regular season and beyond. Yeah. All right. Now, Richard. It. It. Oh, certainly, so, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, the point I wanted to make, so, and, and, and Kyle Busch has been very vocal about this himself. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not um, you know, a, an opinion. And he said one of the reasons they're struggling is that they, they're not having any practice. You know, so, so there's that sort of, Leads, you know, but you look at his teammates, you know, uh, Denny Hamlin and and uh, Martin Truex Jr. have all won races and been competitive. I mean, you know, as you say, Hamlin's probably favourite for the for the, for the championship. You know, Kevin Harvick's won multiple races. Kozlowski's won multiple races. Joe Logano has been up there. Chase Elliott's won. You know, these guys haven't really struggled because of lack of practice. They just stepped so, up their game. Yeah, so especially Penn. I mean, you would yeah. you would figure as as often as Kyle Busch runs, right? Because he's here. Here's a guy for for the bulk of his career has has done the the triple headers and the, and the double headers, and you yeah, know, especially back when he's probably got more miles on each track than any of the other guys. So it, I mean, so it's, it seems odd to me that he's saying it's a lack of practice so that, that's hurting him, practice. him in particular. So. There's two or three th- – yeah, exactly. It's hurting him more than anybody, and that's his excuse if it's yeah. the truth. Because- so then so then it, it, there's two or three things that that sort of points towards from my perspective. Firstly – and again, I wouldn't think this is the case because the other uh, Joe Gibbs cars are doing reasonably well at it. You know, your, your simulation work that you'll do prior to a race to determine your, your, your setup. You know, because you, as a race engineer and the crew chief and the tyre specialist and all these guys sit down – go through all the simulation data and they'll come up with a car setup for, you know, that coming weekend or two weeks or three weeks out, whatever it may be. And then the car gets built that way and then shipped to the track. So you're, you're typically within a pretty good window. And, and, and these cars vary so subtly that, yeah, you know, you can be a little bit out on the ride height or wrong spring or a shock or something, but but never such a dramatic miss over so many races that Carl Busch has been has seen. Um, or you know, then it, then you say, well, maybe they're just really good at dialing a car in throughout happy hour or throughout the practice sessions or whatever you want, and they don't have an opportunity to do that. But it is really strange that they're struggling so much, and. and I, and I'm not, oh goodness me, I, I don't want to say this in a negative way or question Kyle's ability by any stretch of the imagination and the whole 19 team that's there. But if they go through the whole season without this practice or whatever it is, or he only starts winning again when he can start practicing, you know, does that leave a little question mark there? It's just a blur line at this point. Like Eric Jones, when he has consistency, he's pretty much like, can outperform Kyle Busch. Uh, on any given day, it's just he and Kyle are the weakest link of Gibbs. Gibbs Jones is more or less of inconsistency. Kyle Busch is just he's not had it. And when I he, he yeah, hear drivers Kyle. like a Michael McDowell or even a Jesse Little saying that the lack of practice has even up the playing field. But when you look at it, some of those big yeah, teams are still just, able. Yeah, I don't think it has leveled up the play. I mean, and, 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 but this is partly a little my point. Bit. But my, my, partly my point is. And, and this is what people, I think, don't understand at times about the engineering side of motorsport. Everybody's like, oh, things like lack of practice, even at the playing field, uh, you know, budget cuts at the playing field. They don't. 
what happens is the teams with more budget and more staff will become more successful. You know, you take a Joe Gibbs or a Hendrick Motorsports or a Pence. You know, Hendrick have been on point, you know, have been really competitive this year. Mm-hmm. And that's because despite their lulls over the last few years, they have a really, really, really strong engineering department. Probably the strongest in the field, and because and they and it's showing because they will run simulation after simulation after simulation, and they will get their baseline pretty much spot on going into the race. Yeah, and I think they were one of the first major ones to do it. I think if I recall, Landon Castle was the sim driver and helped Johnson yeah. and the car win those championships in that dynasty exactly. run. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, you, 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 I don't think you can use this, oh, well, it's a level, you know, the, the lack of practice levels the playing field. I really, really don't think that's the case. The only thing it, the only thing it, it, it does prove, or the only thing it does is it lacks the driver's little bit of sharpness and them, you know, reconfiguring themselves to the track and learning the nuances and subtlety of the track. But, you know, as we said earlier, Carl's probably in the top five most experienced drivers out there now, probably. Well, let me so, let me let me throw this out, okay? Because I had mentioned that, that Kyle has has so many miles on tracks, because you know he, a lot of times he would run the trucks and the Xfinity races. He'd run anywhere he can. Maybe he just thrives on that amount of track time. You know, maybe that maybe that's just his thing. And now that he's yeah. uh, he's limited in the truck races, he's limited in, in what he can run in Xfinity. And now he's got no practice. Uh, you know, maybe that's just how. Maybe he's the type of guy that needs to always be driving to stay sharp. I don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? Because some, mean, some maybe, maybe it, it could be because that cause if if you think about it, uh, you know the these other guys uh, on the same team. You know, Truex and, and Hamlin have both won, and Hamlin's won you know multiple times. Uh, same team, same engine, engineer. Yeah. Or maybe it's just the way you know Kyle's wired that he always has to be running. Like you know, you remember how like Ken, mean, like like Ken Schrader or or Tony Stewart back in the day when they when they're they're racing in the middle of the week and sprint cars here and there just to just to stay on the track. So yeah, but you know, is that we mentioned it earlier? I think it was either the Bristol or the Martha. I think it's Bristol race. Yeah, he was lapped on pace. I know Bristol's a short lap. But, you know, he was lapped purely on pace, not on damage or being shuffled out oh. through a pit cycle or whatever. You know, I, in the, you know, the time far shorter than you guys, but, you know, I can't remember Kyle ever being in that position. I, and there's something that this is highlighting a weakness. And, you know, I, for the last four or five years, he's been the dominant driver in the field without any hesitation. Even if he hasn't won every championship, he's always been there, thereabouts. I think he's always been in the final four, pretty much, hasn't he? Um, uh, yeah, I believe so. I, I mean, in, since, yeah, and he's, since he won the championship, in, yeah, yeah, since he won the championship for the first. Yeah, now, is this is a weird. It, something's not. But everybody else is performing. You know, it's not like you're seeing a, you know, a, a, a no disrespect to them, a front row motorsport guy winning, or, a, you know. Um, JTG car winning or something, you know, the, the, the big guys are still winning. It's just Kyle's just dropped off the pace of his teammates. You know, if all the Joe Gibbs cars were, were, were struggling, I'd get it. But they're not, you know, Hamlin's out there winning for fun. Truex has had a win. He's starting to, you know, find his rhythm a little bit. As you said, Eric Jones, you know, he's having his day and showing, you know, flashes of speed at times. Kyle's just, he's had the odd good race, but he's just been out at sea, I thought. I've been really, really surprised, because he's the one of the guys that I thought, he'll be able to turn around and just, you know, he's a wheelman, he'll just be able to drive the thing fast. Yeah, you know, practice, no practice. Setup's a little bit off, he's still going to thrush the car around and get it right. It's yeah, there's, really, really strange. Yeah, there's something something about clicking. something about this year just doesn't agree with him. And and, and I want to yeah. say, he's, he's literally grasping at straws. Um, trying to figure it out himself, and he's—I I believe like he's using the lack of practice as, as perhaps a, a crutch or an excuse when he really, uh, you know. Sometimes these drivers just go through these things. We've we've seen oh, yeah. perfectly oh, good yeah, drivers yeah. have have crap seasons, uh, yeah, and, like and and just, it's just something and you can't. Yeah, I'll, I'll Pagano his uh, uh, first year with Penske. Or so, even the so, year so, he went winless in eighteen. The, yeah, the second year with Penske. Yeah, the, this, uh, the year after his championship. You know, and yeah. it just everyone, everyone's ready to write him off. You know, and it's like, oh, what's wrong with Simon? So, but then he he rebounded 
uh, fantastically. So, uh, and and I have I have no reason to believe that uh, Kyle Busch won't rebound fantastically because we all know the guy can drive. Yep. So yeah, it's well, just a matter of how he does going forward because right now it's we're going to Indianapolis. He's no doubt going to be the favorite to win because he's mastered it as of late. But if he does not do well, then yeah, it's just exactly. going to create more buzz. It's going to draw more ire on Kyle. And I feel like in a championship situation like where he's dealing with right now, it's going to separate him from being a strong, noble champion to represent the sport and knows how to handle the pressure. And, or a guy like LeBron James that cracks under pressure poorly. Yeah, Something we'll see. Yeah, I, what, yeah. Well, see. Uh, yeah. Now, now I'm thinking of quotes from the movie Driven. You know, say hey, at the end of the season, man, you might be on top, you might not, but at the end of the day, you'll know who Jimmy Bly is. <laughs> I don't know why somebody somebody had posted a, a, a thing about Driven on uh, on one of the card uh, groups the other day, yeah. which which prompted me to pop in my DVD and watch that movie the other night. But uh, it's actually aged quite well. I enjoyed watching it, but uh, that's another story for another the day. Sort of, the sort of parts that was actually good. There are parts of that movie that are actually good, yeah, yeah. But again, like I said, that's another story for another day. But let's talk about, since you mentioned Indianapolis, uh, the announcement did come out that the Indianapolis 500 will run August 23rd with fans in the stands at 50% capacity. Uh, what the Speedway has done, they have communicated to all of their ticket holders via email or letter or um, via social media. They've asked folks to... To, to chime in evidently there's folks out there that don't have email addresses associated with their account which i find hard to believe this day and age but uh anyway so what they're asking you to do is go ahead and confirm how many of your tickets you'd like to keep um if you have two tickets or less you're relatively safe um myself i have uh, i hold two tickets to the indy 500 i Clicked on my intent to keep my two tickets, and they said you will be able to keep your tickets either in your current location or very close to it. Now, the folks with uh, 8, 10 tickets, 20 tickets, 30 tickets, um, they may have to give up as many as half of their tickets or have their parties split up. Uh, so, I mean, if you're an Indianapolis 500 ticket holder and you have not contacted the Speedway, you have until July 6th to do so. Uh, otherwise, they'll decide what to do with your tickets. And then if, if you don't want your tickets, you can e either get a uh, credit towards uh, next year's race, or I believe you can get a refund, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they're still putting out a decision on the bronze badges. Um, it, it has been made known that the bronze badge will be no good on race day. Um, so if you're going just for the race, then you bought the bronze badge. That's, uh, you may want to look into getting a refund on that. But, uh, for me at the end of the day, I'm glad they're running the race. Obviously the fan reaction is very mixed. Uh, some folks are very happy about this. Other folks are, are not happy about it. Um, the, the one thing that has a lot of people up in arms is they, uh, they seem to still be intent on, keeping the local television blackout uh, despite capping the amount of fans, although I'm not 100% convinced that that's going to stick. I mean, when they when they lifted the blackout in 2016, um, it was only like two days before the race that they announced it. So there's plenty of time. They don't want to announce that they're lifting the blackout when they're still trying to sell tickets or, or, or get folks to go. So uh, we'll have to see that how that plays out. And again, that only folks, affects folks living in the Indianapolis area. So, uh, with that being said, I'll be at Indy. Uh, Louise, you're going to be at Indy. I must be. I have to. It's part of, it's part of the big, that's my, if there's one race, I really want to cover more than any of them. It's this 500 because it's part of my law, my big, what is it now? Post college plan that I set myself by 2020. I'll be in Indianapolis. So I hope, by everything on the media and the photography side of things worked out where I can finally cover the 500 in 2020. Yeah, I don't know. If you, I don't. I don't yeah. know if you'll be able to cover it. Um, just to be 100% honest with you, because they've. I've. I was in contact with Wes Johnson the other day. Uh, there's going to be very few media allowed, so I know I'm. I'm probably not going to get my media creds this year, but I'll. I'll be happy to sit in the stands and be a fan for a year and go back to go back to normal next year. So. <laughs> um, that being said, speaking of Indianapolis, we've got the historic first 
Uh, NASCAR, IndyCar, same weekend, same track uh, happening. July 4th weekend, we'll have the Xfinity cars on the road course, followed by the Indy cars on the road course. And then on Sunday, we'll have the Cup cars on the Oval for the Brickyard 400. Um, Louise, what do you think about this uh, historic crossover weekend where we're not going to have any actual crossover where nobody's going to do both races? Not just that, no fans. I'm just... I'm not, and I've no fans that, either, yeah. I beat that thing to an absolute dead horse already, so I'm going to focus on the racing at hand as best as possible. It is kind of a shame because this race was supposed... On the IndyCar side, it was supposed to be Scott McLaughlin's debut. On the Xfinity side, it was supposed to be Tony Stewart's return to stock car racing since 2016. Now, without the crossover, without those two guys, it loses its luster a little bit. But if there's one thing I'm interesting and very intrigued about the GMR Grand Prix, not just because there's 26 cars, which is very healthy for a, for a road course, it's the fact that it starts, in my opinion, the toughest month of the entire trail, where you're going to have five races in 15 days at three different tracks. Because it's going to help. Because that, to me, whoever remains super consistent and competitive in that five-race span, it's going to be the ones to beat for the championship. If in, if by anything, if they have an issue where they have a car, if they wreck the thing, I feel like for small teams like a Carlin, who are once again bringing one car for the Grand Prix, which is Max Shelton, his season debut, it's going to be in, a bit of an issue financially because they've already, they wanted to have a two-car entry with like Felipe Nasser, but they just cannot with the covid and also being the furthest, one of the most furthest teams away from IndyCar international-wise. And in the grand scope of things, whoever delivers in that five race fans are going to be the ones probably competing for a title. Those who are struggle and if they have issues like attrition and all that, they're going to have a long road ahead because you cannot afford to have bad, bad finishes that is out of your control from a driver's yeah. perspective. And, and when we're doing these double headers, we're racing Saturday and then racing Sunday at uh, Road America, and then we're going to Iowa and we're racing Saturday and we're racing Sunday. So we're going to have to, you know, in, in in the span of the the week in between, convert the cars from road course trim to uh, short oval trim. Um, and, and then there's there's the thing if, if you have a, an accident in race one or if you have an accident in practice. I mean, we saw this with Sato. Uh, where he crashed in qualifying uh, in Texas and then wasn't able to make the race due to the compressed schedule. Now, the, these these guys bring spare cars, but a lot of times the, the spare cars are in oh, you know, various states, <laughs> stages of mm-hmm. completion, and they, they almost never have an engine in them just due to the... Um, you know the engine mileage restrictions. You want to, uh, you know, use up your engine mileage. So, so moving the engine from the uh, primary to the spare is a very time-consuming process. And we saw that that Sato and the Ray Hall Letterman team just ran out of time uh, before they were able to make that swap. So, like, if we we have some issues at Road America in the first race where somebody's badly damaged, at least they have overnight to work on it. But if somebody's, you know, we're gonna have. I believe we're. Louise, are we doing morning qualifying and then afternoon race? I think they're qualifying on Friday, race day on Saturday for Indy. No, I'm talking about Road America. Oh, Road America. I haven't looked that far into it yet. Yeah, I don't know what they're, yeah, I don't know if they're qualifying in the morning, racing in the afternoon. So, again, that's, but it could be somebody. That's what I mentioned them doing. <clears throat> yeah, or, 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 you know, or sometimes they may do an abbreviated qualifying. They always did, I remember when they used to do the uh, the double headers at Detroit. They always had like an abbreviated qualifying yeah. for the second race. So I I don't know what all the plans are for that, but uh, but we are still talking about the July Fourth weekend uh, mm-hmm. where we're going to see. And, and the interesting thing, like you said, with the no crossover, that when when this was kind of first announced and the the there weren't as many things canceled yet, uh, you know. Um, and there weren't as many things shut down. There were some rumblings that uh, we might see Connor Daly uh, and or James Hinchcliffe running that Xfinity race. Uh, Tony Stewart has stated his intention to run that Xfinity race. There was some there was some speculation that Jimmy Johnson may run that IndyCar race because he had a test in Alabama slated with um, with McLaren SP that yeah, didn't McLaren. happen. Yeah, and so, yeah. but he never got that test, so he's obviously not gonna not going to run the IndyCar race without a, out of test. So um, it well, just, like I say, this, when, when you think, well, could have been, but at the same time, uh, you've got the same 
TV network covering both of them, right? So it's very mm-hmm. lucrative to the to the television people. Yeah, um, on the that, Big Boy uh, Network uh, as well. All right, and then then you've got very lucrative to the um, the, the the track owner to have both, and that's Roger Penske who happens to own the IndyCar series and be a very uh, uh, vocal and powerful team owner in NASCAR, uh, who's probably the guy you know who's most responsible for for making this happen. Um, so it's 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 the kind of thing that we as race fans have heard about and dreamt about and talked about and said will never happen for decades, but now we're actually going to do it. So, Richard, what are your thoughts on this as the international international <laughs> person uh, observing American racing? IndyCar and NASCAR is in the same weekend. I think it's going to be a great weekend. I think we should do. It. I mean, I know sometimes you know Indianapolis is probably one of the only tracks that can do it with the logistics and the size of the infield and the garages available to them. But I think it's great. I think it needs to be done more often. And I think it brings something to both series. You know, and it, in both series, you know, is crying out for fans in many ways. And I think we're in a actually in a unique position, which I don't think has happened for a long time. Probably the growth of IndyCar is. is continuing where at the same rate as the contraction car for, for multiple reasons that we've discussed before but um no i think it's great I, i'm looking forward to it it's a you know i'd love to see the uh, cup cars you know raced on the road course there but uh you know just to see the xfinity cars is going to be pretty good and, and maybe we'll get the, the cup cars there one day but um yeah i think it's i think it's going to be really good and you know even in you know the cup series if this experiment goes well with the uh you know we saw it at pocono last weekend you could run road course one day in cup cars and the oval the following day in the in the cup cars now you would have to take two separate cars the logistics of that would be a little bit harder um but you know when they do the west coast swing they stagger multiple cars on separate trumps trans- and everything so i wouldn't think that'd be beyond the realms of possibility um so no, no not I'm at looking all forward to it it'd be nice if more drivers as you say were doing the you know the 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 swap um but you know you gotta you gotta walk before you can run don't you certainly well i think the saddest thing about it is that no fans because this would have been they've always they've always talked about the the opportunity to showcase your product to the other set of fans you know what i mean you get indycar fans that said oh these stock cars aren't so bad you know they're they're not as clumsy clumsy and then 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 you'd have the uh the stock car guys said, wow, these Indy cars are pretty cool. I mean, you, know, you only have to look at the, when a New Garden did them demonstration laps at the Roval last year in front of the NASCAR yeah. crowd and see how many people really, really enjoyed watching that to know that, that race fans are race fans. And, and if it's, you know, if it's got, uh, you know, if it's loud and it goes fast, you're going to like it. Now, well, if only I mean, we could get yeah, I remember, I mean, it was actually the, the race, or oh, sorry, the race, but the weekend where uh, I met my wife was over in Kansas City in 2010, I think it was, when um, the truck race and the IndyCar series had a, you know shared the same weekend. So they've done it in the past, but not. Yeah, the trucks you know, have, the, the trucks have opened series. up. Trucks have opened up for Indy many times. They used to be. They, I thought it was the other way around, actually, wasn't it? Indy opened for the truck series. Uh, the, uh, I think it's the been. The Indy race was on a Saturday night, and the truck race was on the Sunday. Oh, okay. well, there's been, you know, it's, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's yeah, gone yeah. both ways. Yeah, yeah. But the Indies, especially during the like the early days of the IRL back when it was the Northern, what, the Northern Light, Northern Light Indy Racing League or the, yeah, the, the Pep Boys, Pep Boys, Pep Boys Indy Racing League. Yeah, they would often share the bill with the trucks for the weekend. So mm-hmm. and even well, even up to, to current day, the uh, the trucks always race before uh, the Indy cars at, uh, at Texas. Yep. So, but but to get the to get the both both top level series in, in the same place is 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 really something neat, something unprecedented. Yep. Yeah, for sure, it is definitely a, a landmark moment for not just the speedway, both sanctioning bodies, but as well as the network. It's just hopefully come twenty twenty one, if it becomes successful without the crowds, imagine with them. And I hope people look into it because that's the thing some of them i'm not seeing an indie car race like a denny hamlet or a simon patchett will be intrigued to see an austin cedric run but with the pandemic they have to the pageant said yesterday in the video conference that he may have to take the flight back home because of obviously his health and safety is his priority so we'll see how many people stick around to see how they do and maybe who knows we'll get some crossovers next year because i know well, Jimmy Johnson has been interested. As a matter of fact, he's 
got to do the Ganassi IndyCar ride at some point. That's, am I right? Oh, oh yeah. It's it's right. Matter of fact, right after the uh, the Brickyard 400, Jimmy Johnson is testing uh, Chip Ganassi's IndyCar uh, at the yeah. at the Indianapolis Road Course, and that'll be interesting to watch. I mean, that'll I, I don't know if they're gonna have that so on TV or back. stream stream it on YouTube or something, but uh, it'll it's, probably be on Johnson's YouTube channel. Certainly, yeah, but it, it, that's gonna draw some eyes, and that's something that Jimmy's wanted to do. He was he he like I say he was slated with McLaren for um you know back in uh april or something before the whole world shut down uh at alabama but now he's going to get a chance to test the car with ganassi and uh you know somebody was saying why ganassi what happened with so McLaren? is that an open test then or is it just the jimmy johnson test just the jimmy johnson test from what i so understand they're running it, the road course on saturday converting to the oval on sunday and then converting it back to the road course on monday yeah it only takes them a few minutes to convert it okay honestly yeah Somebody, somebody told me it takes what uh, twenty minutes. They just they got to move a couple barriers in that turn okay. two area. Yeah, so. Um, okay. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see. And somebody was saying, "Well, why Ganassi?" I'm like, "What happened with McLaren?" Well, Louise, you and I know the McLaren had put their plans for a third car on ice, so that probably yeah. had thwarted his plans. But uh, when you think about the fact that uh, you know Chip Ganassi gets his cup engines from Hendrick. Uh, I'm yeah, sure they run Chevy. Yeah, should they run Chevy? So I'd imagine be, multiple parties. They said, okay, you can run a Ganassi since they run Chevys on the cop side. We have no problem with it. Yeah, I don't think the, uh, the it's a big problem for a Chevy guy to go run a Honda. I, I know it's not a problem for a Ford guy to run a Honda because we saw it with Kurt Busch. But for some reason, it's a real problem for a Toyota guy to run a Honda. Yeah. So, and, and, and again, uh, Jimmy Jimmy's also on his way out at in Cup. He's mm-hmm. at the end of his contract, so if he pisses somebody off, what are they going to do? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, but that'll be interesting to see. And Jimmy's excited about it. He's put some stuff on his social media where he's working on some arm strength training um, to, uh, to you know to manhandle that Indy car that doesn't have the power steering uh, uh, through that road course. So that'll be fun to watch. I mean, I yeah. who was the who was the last Cup guy to test an Indy car? Was it uh, Keselowski? Keselowski ran uh, Pagano's car at uh, Road America, I believe. Yeah. And had a, been a long time ago. It's now. been a while though, but Keselowski had a lot of fun with it. He really, really enjoyed the experience, and I, I think Jimmy's going to enjoy. Yeah, the well, experience you could too. say Will Davidson, maybe that's that's clutching the straws a little bit. Isn't it? Who? Will Davidson? James Davidson? Yeah. James. Yeah, you know the guy. Yeah. Yeah, but he ran Indy before he ran Cup. Yeah, he finally got to run Cup at Pocono. Finally got to run Cup at Pocono, and he stayed out of trouble. Yeah. yeah, yeah had, a, had a quiet day. Had a quiet day. This is the a guy. Country, yeah. The best thing they said about him was that we didn't talk about him. Right. Yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's exactly what they said. That's exactly that what they said. That infuriated me because I say back in the day, and I think it hurts not having qualifying and that from a television aspect, and they don't get to talk about it like a debutante like James Davison. They Fortunately, they did the next day, but they didn't check up on him. They didn't mind it, they didn't interview them. I mean, we've seen it for Fox. They were able to pull, like, the long stick and all of that to do it. So it's kind of a shame because back in the day, you would have gotten an interview from him. Just get his perspective. I don't think anybody has covered it. And I was, because I would I would totally cover to get his thoughts, but I feel like I have to contact through Bird Racing more than Spire. Because he knows the bird racing camp more than jumping into a new cup team. But yeah, uh, yeah. Um, well, Louise, we could talk after the show. Actually, I, yeah. I know I know somebody who's very friendly with James Davidson. If you want to get an interview set up, so but uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk later yeah. off the air. Um, but yeah, that's that would be a good interview for sure. Uh, James Davidson is an interesting guy. Um, so let's uh, let's make some picks for this uh, for the. Indy, Indy and Formula One. Um, it's hard to go against Penske at the GMR Grand Prix because they've run the race six times and only three guys have won it three times apiece, and that's Will Power and Simon Pagano. So uh, with that being said, I, I think I'm going to say somebody breaks that, and, and I'm going to say Scott Dixon wins this one. Yep, I'm going with Dixon on that one. He was two laps away from winning in, in the West before Pagano that brilliant drive. So I don't see how Dixon not go 2-0 and to start the year. Certainly. Now, Richard, mm. I'm sure you think differently. Uh, no, I don't think you're going to be a million miles away, are you? I mean, um, you can't really 
sort of base anything off of what you saw in Texas because it's such a unique, um, you know, event. But mm-hmm. um, uh, I don't know. Let's have a think. Who could? I mean, hey, why do you go for uh, you know Rosenquist? You know. Yeah, the teams I mean, obviously got the got the stuff together, you know. And, yeah, Rosenquist has run. been he's been pretty impressive almost everywhere he's been. I remember, exactly. Yeah, Mid Ohio, yeah. Middle Mid Ohio last year he was fantastic. Yeah, Rosenquist yeah. had a great race last year before his multiple pit road ex- exits that caused his car on fire. But fortunately, he was able to get a top ten. Now, if weather's not an issue, then yeah, I, I could totally see Rosenquist delivering again at no, the road course. Erickson, one of the two, you know. Oh, yeah, Erickson. It's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, well, that one, if, if he doesn't get involved in a wreck, then I'd imagine he'll do some great things to that one. I haven't thought, I haven't thought of Erickson considering he didn't really ran many laps last year because of a crash. All right, so uh, how about the Brickyard 400? Who do you like for that one? Oh. Uh. Hamlin, Harvick, you know, those two guys are going to be pretty close, aren't they? Pretty much. You've got to pick one of those two. I want to pick Kyle Busch on that one, but right now with things are going. As a matter of fact, if, if maybe that anger or that mean streak, that desire of winning again may propel him in Indianapolis. So I'm going to go with Kyle on this one, regardless of what's happened as of late. All right, and I'm I'm just going to go with Kevin Harvick. Uh, because the guy is pretty bulletproof everywhere. So now before we start talking about Formula One, uh, because we've got Formula One and also IMSA running. Okay, I wanted want to bring up an odd topic uh, involving car liveries uh, because I've been seeing more and more of these kind of really politically themed sort of things <laughs> coming out. We yeah, see Formula now, One. Now, now Bubba, Bubba had the Black okay. Lives Matter. Uh, now somebody is running the. Uh, Stand for the flag, and Mike then Harvin, right, right, right and then now Cor- Corey LaJoy is now going to run yeah. a Donald Trump 2020 livery, livery. and um, and oh, then he's playing a dangerous game. And now, yeah. now in Formula yeah. One, we see Mercedes is going to run a all black livery uh, for Black Lives Matter, and then well, the, and then and McLaren. Equality. Mc, I'm sorry for equality. Okay, yeah. for equality. And then McLaren is now running like a rainbow kind of scheme uh, on their cars. Yeah, for, for... Austria. Right. Okay. Yeah, so... for, for... Because June was Pride Month. We're now in July. Right. So I think it's just only for the Austrian Grand Prix. But, yeah, okay. as far as the Corey LaJoy thing, the only comment I'll say is that the entity involved with that paid a good amount of money for that race team, and they pretty much – took it because they're in shambles financially they're trying to keep themselves afloat for 2021 right i think somebody did the same thing in in 2016 paid for that that same livery so. for, for but, reed Sorensen at the 55 car i think it might have been a different ordeal because i know they said for lajoy that race team they got about thirty thousand dollars they paid to sponsor to help sponsor them somewhere around the park in the 30,000. So that's a lot of money in these days to be paid to run something like that on their car. Right, right. So, but my question is, right, do, I mean, do these kind of politically charged messages and socially charged messages have any place in racing? I mean, is this, are we, I mean, don't we just want to, don't we just want to race cars or, 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 or do you guys feel like this is a good thing that we are, you know, being socially aware? I mean, I, I, I'm not, leaning one way or the other on it. I just happened to, to notice that, that a bunch of these all came up at once. So what are your thoughts? I think it's a difficult, to, difficult topic, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you could argue there's no space in, no, no place in um, sport for politics, but we, we live in a, a society where, you know, athletes have a social responsibility and have an opportunity to, um, you know, get across a point, should we say, that maybe wouldn't be able to be made by, by, you know, in other ways. So it is a difficult thing. I think, I, I, I think what is potentially causing the 
problem and the uh, animosity is we're in a social climate right now where a little bit of calmness and subtlety I think is required to balance everything out and I can see how certain people with certain beliefs saw that what Bubba Wallace was doing was disrespectful and I see how um, you know again how other certain, certain, uh, certain groups of society will see how what Corey LaJoy is doing is disrespectful and, and maybe that's that's you know people who are, are, are peddling these um, sponsorship deals and the like uh, need to maybe I wouldn't say look carefully at what they're doing but I think there's a time and a place for it and I think maybe and I, uh, I I'm not bringing any personal opinions but what the Corey LaJoy team are doing or not him not the team but the sponsorship there it's like could, is is that the right time for that to happen? Uh, you see what Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are doing. They're suspending their political advertising because for this exact reason, you know, that they're, they're trying to take a step back from, um, you know, the, the controversies that are going around. Is what Mercedes is doing a political statement or a social statement? I see that more as a social statement. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's where it's hard, it, it, hard to it, draw the what, line, yeah. yeah and, it's, and there's nothing, so there's the nothing world, wrong with being socially aware and socially responsible, but but I just yeah. – where, where do you draw the line? And, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so it's like I said, I, I – Timing. Yeah, it's just yeah, – I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't want to get into a really deep, you know, <laughs> un, uncomfortable conversation at all. But, you know, I, I'm used to, <laughs> you know, from – from when I grew up, you know, you, you, you'd pay your money here, slap Valvoline on the side of the car, and you slap Valvoline on the side of the car, and, and you, you didn't worry a whole lot about yeah. making a social statement. But but you've seen it everywhere. I mean, you're seeing that. I mean, the NBA is doing some things. The NFL is doing some things. So, the I mean, but that's league. social. Yeah, it's just, it's just where we are as a society. Statement. So Yeah, yeah. But, but, but what you know, what the NFL is doing, what, what the, whatever the sport is doing is a social statement. It's not a political statement, and that's where I think the the line has to be drawn. I I don't mind watching a sporting event and seeing a social um, statement, especially on equality and inclusion, because I think we you know it's something that still you know even in 2020 we're still having to work towards. But yeah. do I want to watch a sporting event and have a political statement? A political statement is somebody's opinion. A social statement is a corporate opinion. You know, all the big corporations, you know, Ford, Toyota, Chevy, they're all going to say, look, we need inclusion, we need equality. You know, Mercedes, all the big Ford, one thing to say, look, you know, we need inclusion, we need equality. It, it's, it's a branding issue. Is a political, you know, should these teams and these companies be involved in political statements as well? I think that's where it's drawing a line because, again, it's – do what would I – you know, you, know, you don't get offended by a, uh, you know, a, a, um, I don't know, a, you know, M&M's, com- you know, logo on the side of a, a Joe Gibbs car. But, you know, people would be offended potentially by this Go Fast Racing car, you know, from, from this weekend coming up. Certainly so, they would, yeah. You, yeah. But, but, you know, and, and, and that – in all fairness, NASCAR has a target audience, and there's probably going to be a lot more people for that livery than against it in a, t- in a typical NASCAR environment. Um, so it's a very del- delicate balancing act. Uh, you know, you, you have the NRA sponsoring events at Bristol. They're a political, I know they're not directly, political, but they are a very politically charged uh, organization. NRA has sponsored, um, you know, some of the Childress cars recently when, you know, because Richard Childress, he was president of the NRA for a while there. So, you know, th- there is this grey line, and I think that they really do have to be careful with bringing politics into the sport. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, well, I mean... And sum it up right there. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. I mean, to that point, you've, you've even, even if you go about like, like the UAW, right, United Auto Workers Union, 
that's a very politically charged group, but it's been quite involved in racing. So, but but they again have political agendas as well. So, I you know whatever keeps the race cars on the track um, to a point is good for me. So, but let's uh, let's get off of that topic and uh, let's talk about the Formula One season finally getting <laughs> underway, and we're gonna run oh, finally. <laughs> we're gonna run at the Red Bull Ring. We're gonna run two consecutive weeks on the same track. Um, the Formula One is not. I guess in a position to do a double header like the IndyCars were, where they'll race back to back. Is that just, Richard? Yeah. Is that just technically impossible with the uh, uh, with the way the cars are in Formula I One, or, or is it? I don't think it's technically impossible. I just think there's not the need to do it. Okay. Um, I, I don't. I, I don't think there's any. And you know the the. Um, yeah, I, 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 I mean, they could do it. I mean, geez, what's you know, what's the difference? And um, you know, you, some days you'll do as many laps on a Friday as you do on a Sunday. So certainly. Um, well, but here's where's here, the design? Where's the need? I don't think they need. To, I don't well, think well, here, well, here's here's my here's my thought on that, right? Some of some of the double headers and some of the reasoning behind that, right? And the compressed weekend is to limit the travel or the limit the amount of time that the, the drivers and crew are out and about and staying in hotels and whatnot so i mean are we gonna yeah, every, sure. is, is everybody gonna run home from austria in, in the uh, you know monday through wednesday, wednesday yeah. or are we gonna stay through you know so you know because yeah, i i initially thought that curious. the you know like some of the the short weekends were to just to limit the amount of time that the folks are out and about and out of quarantine, so but uh, and that's not yeah, here nor there. It's an interesting, it's an interesting point. I, I say from a sporting standpoint, I don't think they need to do it. Yeah, I don't think Formula One isn't about having fifty-five races a year or whatever it is like they're doing the Cup Series. You know, it, it's about quantity or quality over quantity, and I think that's where they're trying to you know generate is these quality events, standalone events, and um, you know, I think having the, the two weekends in Austria is good. I think. I think at the moment it's Austria and the UK that are um, that are yep. set for double headers, aren't they? Uh, that's yep. my so, understanding. Yeah, we're going to two mm-hmm. races in Austria and then two races at Silverstone. Yeah, yep. the Silverstone one, Silverstone one is is um, you know not going to be too much an issue because outside of three of the teams, everybody else is based in the UK and will most of the mechanics stay at home anyway during that weekend. Very few of them stay at hotels around the area, um, so I don't think that. Um, be interesting to see. Yeah, you know, as I, 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 I don't think that it's a huge, uh, huge issue of the, the British Grand Prix. Austria, as you said, it'll be an interesting one to see what people do. I'm guessing they're going to try and keep them out there. I'm guessing they're going to stay out there. But which is an issue because you know, at the start of the season, when you have the first flyaway races, I mean, a lot of the mechanics are away for a month, so you know they've missed all that fun. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. They can't go out and get. Get absolutely smashed like they normally do. I mean, no, no, we'd never do that. Um, you know, the, you know, the, uh, the old Wiener schnitzel will be going down pretty well in Austria, you know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so let, let's talk about the race. I mean, obviously, yeah. it's been, I, I see, like, it's been forever since the preseason testing. I can't even mm-hmm. remember. Yeah, yeah. I can't even remember how that went. <laughs> I mean, there well, was, there was some, something, something with, with, uh, with uh, Mercedes' uh, uh, new steering system that, uh, was... Yeah, that was the big. I mean, basically, <coughs> basically coming out of preseason testing, Mercedes fast, Ferrari slow, everybody else. Yeah, Racing Point were a surprise because they have well, the older yeah, Mercedes cars. Where do you I stand by them? them? I do not think that Racing Point will be as competitive come Austria as they were in testing. I think there's a little bit of sandbagging going. Or a little yeah, bit I was of... going to say, I think I fig- you were going to mention sandbagging. <laughs> Because you know. even if it's an, a year old, if I recall, a year old Mercedes cars, it'll be. It, I don't know how they'll do it because right now it's not. It's yeah. not. There's so many things that you can't see on these cars. Yeah, they don't want to unveil it all at yeah. Barcelona. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, these teams do work very closely together. You know, engineers transfer from one team to another, but you'd have to have like a your technical director, your chief aerodynamicist. And half a dozen of the, a dozen of the guys move from one team to another well before the start of the design of that car. You know, like, we're talking like a year ahead of the, you know, to, to get a car built that has that philosophy and have the, 
you know, they've just picked up a front, you know, a no, the nose looks similar, that little bulbous nose cone, and a few other things look similar. But I find it a little bit annoying, and I think probably Racing Point found it a little bit annoying. Oh, we, you copied the Mercedes. For a start, the FIA will never allow that to happen because they do a lot on intellectual property and designs, and you have to submit your designs to the FIA for this exact reason, going back to the whole, um, you know, uh, Mike Coughlin, and Nigel Stepney, Ferrari mm-hmm, McLaren, Stephanie. Spygate thing. So, you know, the, the FIA do take this thing this, this very seriously. Very, very, very seriously. Um, so it's not a copy. It, it really isn't. And it's just silly for people to say that, I think. Um, but I just I just think they were running light on fuel at times and they were, th- th- they were sort of punching a little bit above their weight. I... I imagine they may they. I imagine it'll be fifth or sixth in terms of overall speed. I think you know you're going to have your uh, Mercedes, Red Bull, who are bringing a lot of updates to Austria, and Ferrari will be your top three. Then I think you're going to throw like McLaren and Renault into that mix ahead of Racing Point. Yeah, um, and. And to make my point across, I'm, ask, I'm definitely saying no. They're not going to go on and get a surprise win. They're going to probably no. at most a podium, pending on attrition and yeah, other I things. I can't even see that. I can't even see that. I think if they get if they get like a sixth or something, it'll be a good weekend. Maybe a fifth. Nothing more than that, because again, you, you don't have high attrition these days in Formula One in no. reality. You know the no. cars are too no. reliable. No, it's, it's, you know. And, and, you know, um, Red Bull are bringing big updates to uh, Austria, so they'll be quick. Ferrari that in mind. Are bringing, sorry, go go on with okay. Ferrari before Ferrari I ask my are question. bringing big updates to Hungary, which is the race after Austria. Um, oh. So they've used this time well. You know, this this whole lockdown, they haven't been set at home. You know, like everybody else has, they've been working pretty damn hard to get these things done. You feel like this calendar Porsche starting off with Austria and the string of races, you think Red Bull could be knocking into mix for constructors or they still got some ways to go consider how Mercedes in their, in my opinion, how I view it, the old retro 93-94 Sauber livery, because that's what it reminds yeah. me of. Yeah, it will now, yeah. Um, Where do you see them now? With the season starting as it is right now? It's a good question. It's an interesting question. I... We don't know what Mercedes are bringing to uh, Austria. When when Mercedes did their run, you know that they were allowed to do pre, uh, you know the race. They ran an old car. They didn't run the current spec car. So we don't know what they're bringing. Red Bull decided to run and they in turn used a filming day, uh, run a these were their 2020 uh, car. So we saw what changes they've made and what how aggressive they've been. And Honda apparently have an engine upgrade, engine spec upgrade. So a lot of these baseline parts, because if you think about it, I mean, we're what, in July now? Mm-hmm. Most teams would be on their, at least their second, if not starting to introduce their third iteration of car. For this yeah, it's, a, it's unbelievable how late so, the season is getting going. Yeah, right? so I, I think we can only take so much in pre-season now will red bull be challenging mercedes i think in austria they will because that's just a track that max drives so well he's yeah just, and that's where he's I got that place like... down to a fine art right now and it suits his style it suits his um the car i think um so it'll be interesting to see then because you're going to hungary You'd probably say that, again, would suit the Red Bull over the Mercedes. I mean, the only reason that Hamilton won last year was because of fantastic strategy, and he really pulled that out the back. And, and that's, Hungary's typically not a track that suits Red Bull. Then you go to the UK, you'd, you'd expect Mercedes to be pretty strong there. Um, and then I don't know where I have to up to that. I know we'll go to... Yeah, Catalonia, Spa, and I believe Monza. Yeah, Catalo- I see, yeah Spain's thrown in there. Again, Mercedes will probably be strong in their spa. Yeah, that's all. There was a lottery. And then Monza, again. You know, it depends where Ferrari are with that, but you'd probably be looking at Mercedes again. So I'd, I'd love to see at the end of that little two-month stint that we're about to start on, I'd love to be in a position where, you know, Max is leading the championship or, you know, I don't think 
uh, Red Bull are in a position to challenge for constructor championship. And that's no disrespect to Alex Albon. I just think he's still learning a little bit. I think I'd go as far as say, I think if it'd been a regular season without all those the people, he'd be in a better position. I think with this, you know, unknown, I think this will suit the more experienced drivers and the more experienced teams when it comes to execution. And I think that Red, you know, Mercedes do have that edge over Red Bull when it comes to execution. However, Red Bull have turned around and said this is the most prepared they've been for a season since 2013. So it's going to be a fascinating first couple of weeks. But I expect that it's going to be, I expect Austria will be a battle between three drivers. I think Bottas, Hamilton and Verstappen. I think it's going to be between these, those three guys um, in, in Austria. All right. So we're, we, are, Austria, we are just about out of time. But but I do I did, I do want to throw one thought at you, Richard, and it's going to put us in overtime. Um, but since Formula One is so late getting the season started, they went ahead they went ahead and already had the silly season. So so bit, yeah. in, in essence, we've got several drivers out there: Vettel, um, Ricardo, mm-hmm. Sainz, who are essentially lame ducks in their own seats. Uh, yeah. I mean, what I mean, what do you expect to see out of, out of those guys? You know, I know, well, like, like a guy like Ricardo, I, 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 I could still see him giving it his all. You know, yeah. even knowing that, uh, but, mm. but, uh, but Vettel, um, you know, and Signs knowing that uh, much better things are on the horizon for him. I think Signs, McLaren have turned around and said they'll be open with him within reason. I thought they're going to the Mercedes engine next year at McLaren, so the information that gets carried over won't be as applicable as the other teams. Um, Ricciardo, I think he'll give his all. I think Renault will screw him over. You know, I, I, that just hasn't worked. And I think Cyril can be a little bit vindictive. And I think there'll be a little bit of animosity within the team. And I think... And know, so so if, a Renault is, if a Renault is going to break down, it'll be Daniel's car. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah Danny like... brought in as this guy that's going to propel them to the championship, or at least to be a contender. And you know, they haven't provided in the car. You know, and, oh. and, and you know, so I, I can't blame him for wanting to go to McLaren, especially if Ferrari didn't want him or took signs over him. Then you know, I think that's a good move for him. Renault is just, I, I, w- I wonder about Renault. I, there's something just doesn't sit right with that whole thing. Yeah, uh, and yeah. who knows how Ocon is going to fare either. They're bringing yeah. him back. I mean, Ocon's obviously quick. I mean, you saw that when he was with Force India or mm-hmm. whatever they were back in the day. So, um, And then Seb at Ferrari, that's going to be an interesting one. I mean, who knows what he's doing next year? He may he may be out there trying to pass a team, or he may be like, you know what, guys, I'm retiring at the end of the year. I'm going to disappear after – I'm going to – do four or five races, get bored, get fed up, realize that there's no point in this. You know, Charles is beating me. We don't have a car for that we can win the championship. Um, you know, so, I'm in other words, have... kind of like a James Hunt or a Nicky Lauda re- yeah, you retire mid season. Like can somebody get, somebody get Luca Badoa on the phone? You know, I've done with this. <laughs> Luca Badoa. Is he still oh, the best driver after all these years? Say Crusher. Oh, probably, yeah. Crusher, it's time to call Joe Tanto. Uh, <laughs> with yeah. guys, with, with that thought, we are we are out of time and we're in overtime. So, Louise, Richard, thank you guys so much. Really looking forward to um, just having so much racing this weekend. We've got uh, IMSA, Xfinity, Indy cars, Cup cars, and Formula One all within the space of this weekend. So, uh, uh, race fans, enjoy that. I want to thank all you folks that listen to the show. I want to thank Hoobazoo Radio Network, iHeartRadio, Speaker, and Google Podcast. And until next week, good night. Enter your website. Enter your website. Enter your website. Enter your website.